Good morning, all of you. So today, as I promised the other day, I'll be doing the the exercise of establishing the product function through product uh, the functional tree. What we are drawing is essentially a functional tree. So I'll do for a product. I hope all of you would have done the same exercise for fingernails. I mean, fingernail clip off. Now what I'm going to do is, uh, the today's agenda is, I'll take up another example, do the task of establishing the, uh, the product function, then I'll give you the, the weekly assignment, which will be establishing the product function through the functional tree, okay? Then after that, we will see what are the limitations of these processes. And I am going to introduce another method which is much more robust, which is much more... Uh, what do you, by the way, understand by the term robust? Something is robust means it is not uh, likely to fail. It is error-free or... Uh, okay, it is more difficult to fail if you proceed in that way. So we will see that and that will complete the day's task. Is it okay? Now the product that I took for uh, establishing the product function through product tree, the functional tree, is, uh, next slide please, an emergency lab. All of us know how an emergency lab works. Okay. So I thought I will establish the, the function tree for this particular product. What is the first step? The first step is to draw two vertical dotted lines that distinguish the product domain. This is the, the domain of the product design exercise. Okay. Now, the, the first step is to drawing two vertical lines. So, left to right movement is governed by the house flow and right to left is governed by the white flow. Is it okay? The next step is, now, what is the product? The product is an emergency lab. Okay, let's not go now. We will, go, we will see all these steps later. We will see all these steps later. Let us concentrate on the first one. What should an emergency light do? Emergency light must switch on the LEDs. Nowadays most of the emergency bulbs use LEDs. Is it okay? Now can, can, can come, somebody trace the evolution of lighting? What is the, what is the first? Uh, yes? Okay. Very good, very good. You, you, you thought ahead of me. You went still further back. Fire. Great. Then what else? In modern times what is the source of a bulb lighting? Filament lamp. Now do you know that there is a worldwide movement against filament lamp? People they don't want filament lamps. Why, why people don't want filament lamp? It is highly energy inefficient. Why it is energy inefficient? You said it? Heat. So what do you mean? Heat. Heat is it a measure of inefficiency? See, I want all the input energy, which is the electrical energy, to be converted into light. Any other form of energy existing is not going to help me in a bulb. It is a nuisance. So, the filament bulb is highly inefficient. The proof of that is, if you touch a filament bulb, I mean the outer glass of a filament bulb, you feel it very hot. You don't want heat there. If heat is produced, that means what? Light is not produced. So much of so much of energy is not converted into light. That itself is a proof that it is highly inefficient. Tube light will not be that uh, hot. Okay, please don't don't try these experiments. Okay, believe me when I say. At times you can believe your teacher. So no, filament bulb it will be very hard to touch. Tube lines will not be that hot to touch. CFD 
quantities are still better. CFLs, okay, they are still better. But what is the best? Best are the LEDs. Now people are talking about street lighting using LEDs. People are talking about in another 20 years you will, you will see no other form of lighting. The only form that is available and that is used will be LEDs. So in emergency lamp people use LED bulbs. So how do I achieve, how do I get an emergency lamp? By lighting an LED. Is it okay? See the first step alone. We will come back to the uh, all the other steps later. Next slide please. Why? Why do I want? Why do I want to light an LED? I go back. No, no. I, I, I go back to the left. So that is to provide light when power gets off. When the power goes off, I want to provide light, and that is how I get. That is that is why I should light up an LED. Is it okay? Next step. Next slide, please. Now, how do I light an LED? By converting electrical energy to light energy. Next slide please. So to convert electrical energy to light energy, first what should I do is, the emergency light is to switch on when there is no power. So first of all, I should store the power. That is an important step. Okay. So I should store the power in some batteries, we will come to that later. Next slide please. So to store power, I should acquire the electrical energy. So from that, how do I acquire electrical energy? Next slide please. So by an external source which provides electricity, I right? acquire the electrical energy. So the topmost line, if you see this, this topmost line, that gives me the critical part. That gives me the series of steps that are performed to realize functionally an emergency light, an emergency lamp. Is it okay? What are the steps? You get electricity, then you acquire that electrical energy, store the electrical energy, convert electrical energy into light, you, you get that, you realize that by burning LEDs, this is to provide light when the power goes off. Strictly speaking, these, this diagram is to be drawn in two phases. Because basically an emergency lamp exists in two states. One is during charging. When the electricity is on, okay, that is the charging phase. So that the, the functionality is altogether different. When the electricity is on, what is it supposed to do? Get the energy, store it in the battery and remain alert. So that when the energy, when the electricity goes off, it can switch off. Is it okay? Now, so strictly speaking, I must draw this in two different states. Okay, I have not done this. Because in practice nowadays we are not using functional trees much. Functional trees I am discussing in detail because that will help you to do the next task better. That is why we are taking up the functional tree. So do you understand how to draw it in two states? What are the two states? When the electricity is available, what the product does is primarily charging. When the power goes off, it provides the electricity. Now let us come down the line and then see. Lighting LED, what are the issues? Now the first issue is I should focus the light. LED not only, I mean, an emergency lamp not only just provides light, but it should also focus the light. I don't know, every, every lighting frame, it has some means by which the light is focused. So here you have a either a circular a parabolic reflector on the on the rear of the bulb. Okay, because it is a cylinder. In this in this uh, lighting system, it is a cylinder. 
which produces light energy in all the directions. What goes up is waste. I don't want that. So I want to have a reflector which reflects that light and then send back to the room. Okay, what goes up is goes it goes to the ceiling. I don't want that to happen. So I want to provide a reflector which reflects and then sends the light down into the room. So one thing is first I should focus the light. That is another function that I should perform. Now light tends to scatter. Okay. In LED lighting particularly, there are many other issues because the light is uh, there are there are miniature light emitting diodes located everywhere and these lights are emitted in all directions. So they try to scatter. So that is a negative aspect, that is why it is an ill effect. I didn't want that to happen, but it is happening anyhow. That is why I put it within the double lights. So again I, I should take some effort to minimize the scatter. How do I minimize the scatter? Probably by positioning the LEDs in such a way that and by positioning the reflectors I can minimize the scatter. Then I need some sort of control, some way by which it can be switched on and switched off. Okay. Then I need to indicate the status, whether it is in charging mode, whether it is discharging, whether the battery is being used up, some indication is necessary. Okay, when the when the when the battery is also almost when it is go off, when it is about to go off, that can also be indicated. So status indication is also required. These are all the functions I want to achieve while talking about lighting LED. Then the second step is converting electrical energy to light. Okay, while well, converting electrical energy into light, the ill effect associated with that is heat dissipation, heat generation. There will be some amount of heat generated in any process. So that is an ill effect. This is a measure of inefficiency. Then I should dissipate that heat. I should dissipate that heat. That heat is to be sent away. Then coming to the next step, Store power. This is another important functionality that must be achieved by a by a emergency lamp. It should have an in-house battery in which all the power or at least some of the power okay, is stored when the power is on so that this power can be used when the power goes off. So how do I store the power? I have to convert AC to DC because DC storage is only possible, direct current storage is only possible. I have to convert AC into DC, I have to charge the battery, I have to discharge the battery periodically, I should have some mechanism. Then whenever you have a battery, what will be the battery? It generates fumes. Where do I get fumes in the battery? So this generate fumes, it must be in double line. Sorry, it is my mistake. I should put it in double lights, generate fumes. See, basically in any battery you have an electrochemical reaction taking place. So there are a few products of uh, products of these electrochemical reactions. These are the fumes. These fumes, it must be in double line because it is an undesirable effect. So like, like generating heat, this should also be in double lights. So, sorry not discharge battery, generate fumes must be in double light. Then I should, I should dissipate these fumes. I should send out these fumes. Is it okay? Now I should, I should acquire the electrical energy from the outside power source. So I should have on, on top, okay, these are some universal functions. I have to have a, a, an aesthetic appearance. I should support loads. Okay, and I should insulate it properly because there should not be any electrical shocks. The whole system must be compact. It should be more efficient. These are all some universal requirements. So I have established the functional tree for a particular product. Is it okay? 
there are a lot of disadvantages in this method. Now I'll, I'll show, I'll, we will understand the disadvantages later, but the, see the examples I took are only simple examples. Well, what is the example I have taken? I have taken a nail clipper or, uh, or an iron box or what is this? This is a emergency. Uh, emergency lamp. When you go to a complex system, the single most disadvantage of functional tree is I am not able to con concentrate on certain interactive effects. In most of real life systems, there is there is a lot of interaction between a lot of interaction between different subfunctions. There is one product. The product is having many subfunctions, but these subfunctions they have some interaction among them. What do I mean by interaction? What do I mean by interaction? For example, for example. Suppose you take a, a really complex system, like automobile. You are talking about braking. Braking is a function of an automobile. It is a functional subsystem of an automobile. Okay? Now, while braking is taking place, ideally, can I keep on accelerating the engine? So, while braking is taking place, naturally, there is no point in accelerating the engine. How do we achieve this? In a car, okay. In a car, how do you ensure that when applying brake, you don't accelerate? Part of the single leg. No. A single leg is used. Single leg is used for yeah. do you drive a car? Huh? Fine. So for the, a brake and accelerator we use single leg. So by, by, by a simple design, you ensure that because the same leg is supposed to be used for applying brake and accelerator, they are positioned in such a way that you take away the leg from the accelerator and use it for applying the brake. You, you, you get the point. A very simple design ensures that, ensures that you don't accelerate and of course you can, you can rotate your uh, leg by 90 degrees and press both together. <laughs> Such behavior cannot be taken into account in, in any super design. Is it okay? No, but, 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 but for normal functioning, how do I ensure? So what, what I wanted to stress was there is something called an interaction effect. There is something called an interaction effect. This has to be taken care of in my design. And I mean interactions are so many. There are a lot of interactions. I only gave an example. For example, I mean, let us take about the braking itself. Forget about the interaction between acceleration and braking. I want to brake a vehicle. Then I must know, okay, what is the power that I want my braking system to absorb? The power, that is the energy rather, the energy available to the system, that needs to be absorbed by my braking system. So how much of energy am I talking about while designing the braking system? This is essential. So, please remember, any subsystem doesn't exist or operate in isolation. There must be a very, very synergetic action between these subsystems. That cannot be represented, that complexity cannot be represented by such simple diagrams. That is the single important deficiency of the function trees. How are we going to overcome that? We are going to overcome that by next slide, please. We'll we'll come to that. That, that is the second part of the today's lecture. How to overcome that? 
how to see if, see the most important aspect in product design is how to capture the functional requirements. The moment you do that, the product design becomes easy. What the what are all the main functions and sub-functions to be performed by a product? That you have to identify very carefully. That is the single most important step, and that is why we are spending so much of time. So we will we will do. I will give you an assignment on functional trace. After that, we will see the more robust method of capturing the functional requirements. Next slide, please. So assignment number one for the second term. Zero to five. We'll draw it for an electric fan. One and six for air conditioner. Maximum one page. Okay, now please write your register number. Somebody has not written the register number. What am I to do? Well, probably I thought he is testing my intelligence. So what I did was, so his, uh, his was a particular topic. So I have to eliminate all the other, because topic wise the numbers, assignments are given. Okay, so I have to do a lot of heuristic uh, search and then identify his number. I don't know who is that gentleman. Is he available now? Huh? Ah, great. Please don't do that. Okay. Do you agree that I am intelligent? Did I pass your test? Huh? Thank you. So, so right? No, no. See, no file, nothing is necessary. Let it be simple. I am not very much interested in cosmetics. So, first, a single page. Title, electric fan, your roll number, name, as a, as a redundancy. Okay. <coughs> roll number. Okay. Name, what do you write? It is a redundancy. In case you make a mistake in your number, your name will help. So, register number, name, and a work page, functional tree, diagram. That is good enough. Okay. One page and the, and the due date is next uh, Thursday. Thursday? Huh? Thursday. Oh, next Thursday. Got it? Oh, close it, sir. Go to L12. L12. Thank you. So today, what we are going to what we are going to talk about is creating a function structure. This is another technique. What we have seen is fast. What earlier we have seen is fast. But now, what we are going to discuss is creating a function structure. Now let us spend some more time in whatever we have discussed earlier because understanding this is very crucial in in creating function structure. Next slide. Right. Again, we are going to employ a black box model. A subsystem is going to be, a system or subsystem is going to be viewed as a black box. <laughs> something is given in and something is going to come out. How this black box is realized? That is the job of the designer which he will take up later. For example, suppose the black box is supposed to store energy. The black box is supposed to store one, one activity, one function that needs to be mapped is storing energy. Store energy is one sub-function. So this black box is supposed to store energy. Now, how that is going to be achieved, that is the job of the designer. He will, he, we will talk about it later. But now, what we are interested right now is, like this, what are the basic functions that needs to be realized? The moment I have a list, I can give you one, give another, another project. Okay, then it can be realized. Comprehensively, I want the list to realize the product, what are all the sub-functions that needs to be performed. And what are the interactions between these sub-functions? That is the stage in which we work right now. Now, in black box, naturally, it has certain inputs, it has certain outputs. Why I am not 
talking about the black box. About the black box, you are going to study for the remaining six semesters. Please take it from me. How I am going to realize this black box is what essentially you are going to study in another six semesters. Okay. How you can store electrical energy, how you can convert electrical energy into torque, how you can convert okay, a particular power, a particular speed torque combination into certain other speed torque combination. These are all the various black boxes. There are thousands of black boxes like this in engineering. How to achieve all this, you will be studying in various subjects in engineering. Now my task is to teach you how to identify these various black boxes. Right. Every black box, it has three flows taking place along. One is material flow. The another is an energy flow. The third is an information flow. One is an energy flow, another is a material flow, another is an information flow. You have to understand this very very carefully. Unless you do this, okay, you won't be able to do the functional mapping properly. But let me spend some time on this. Suppose say my black box. My product here is an engine, is a petrol engine, is a petrol engine. Can you tell me what are all the materials that can flow into a petrol engine? Petrol. 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 Good. Air. Oh, good. Air is another material which is flowing into the engine. Then? Lubricants. Good. Very well said. Lubricants are other material flowing into the petrol engine. Can you tell me what are the materials that are coming out of the petrol engine? Exhaust. 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 Fumes, exhaust gas is the material which is coming out of the petrol engine. Anything else? Water. Probably the lubricating oil collected in the sun is again material coming out in the out of the engine. Some some small particles, bad debris, getting collected in that is again material coming out of the petrol engine. Clear? So what are the materials flowing in? Air, petrol, <laughs> lubricants. What are the materials coming out? Exhaust gas. That, that is the fumes, okay. Then the oil getting collected in the sun and the debris in that oil. This is the material. Is there energy flow taking place in the engine? Is there energy flow taking place in an engine? Yes. What is it? What is the energy coming into the engine? Yes. I have heat coming into the engine. Am I putting a stove and then heating the engine? No. It is going out. Pressure. I am talking about a petrol engine. What is the energy input to the engine? Where, where does it come from? Okay, the chemical energy available with the petrol is something which is flowing in. The petrol is having some caloric value. So if the flow rate of petrol is so much, so much of calories are being sent in or calories are not units that are preferred. So many kilojoules of energy is sent in per hour or per minute or per second. So that is the energy flowing in into the engine. And what is the energy coming out of the engine? Heat energy. Where do you get the heat energy? Somebody said heat energy. Let me talk that first. Why do you get the heat energy from the engine? You are right, but what is coming out of the engine? I am not, please believe me, I am not ready to look into what is happening inside the 
black box. That is why I call it as black box. I don't want to look into what happens inside. I am just worried about what goes in and what comes out. What comes out of the engine? Is there any heat coming out of the engine? No sir. Oxygen. Yes or no? Oxygen. No sir. Where is that heat coming? Exhaust gas, they carry away some amount of heat. So that is heat coming out of, heat energy coming out of the engine. If we have a radiator, if it is a, if it is a, if it is my two wheeler, okay, I provide fins around the engine so that more heat can be dissipated to the air. So that is heat coming out of the engine. I want to cool my engine, so I provide fins. So that is heat that is carried away by the flow of air. There is some amount of heat lost in the exhaust gas. So exhaust gas take away some amount of heat. Is there any other energy flow? Yes. The mechanical energy is coming out of the engine in the form of speed and torque. Okay. That is the useful mechanical energy that is coming out of. So I have understood the, I have understood the material flow. I have understood the energy flow. What is this? Information. Is there any information flow taking place? So we are not the IT department. We are mechanical engineers. Should we bother about information flow taking place? Is there any information flow happening there? A volume I don't see. Huh? A volume of control. What? A, a, a volume of control going. So, please remember, unless there is no information flow, I don't have any control over the process. <coughs> so, how does an engine know whether it should run faster, whether it should run, produce more energy? How does it know? In your bike, how does your engine know that it should try to pump out more energy? Accelerator. You, you give acceleration. That means what? The engine is generating more amount of energy. What is this to the black box? You, you pulling your accelerator, what does this mean to the black box? What is my black box? What is my black box now? Please tell. Engine. Okay. So this is an information to the petrol engine. My acceleration, the accelerator position is an information to the petrol. Is there any other information? Beautiful. Okay. So brake is another information to the engine. Clutch is another information to the gear is another information to the engine. Do you call it now? Do you understand? So gear, what information does it say to the engine? Increase the speed, sir. Change the speed. Increase the speed and decrease the speed. It, 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 it tells the engine, okay, rather, rather a subsystem of an engine, which is a gearbox, it tells the gearbox whether you have, whether you need, whether to produce more speed or more torque. Yes. So, so that must be an information flow in any system. So in any systems, please believe me, there must be three flows that have to take place. One is an energy flow. The second one is the material flow. The third one is a information. So the material flow is designated by a dark line. The energy flow is designated by a thin line. The information flow, if this is not uh, because of any hatred I have for IT, but this is the standard convention. The information flow is for is designated by a dark. Is it okay? Uh, this is not my convention. Please believe me. So this is the general convention followed in, in 
functional representation for us. So energy flow is designated. Never, you should never forget. Okay, energy flow is designated. So you'll have many boxes. There will be some flow into the box, some flow outside the box. Energy flow is designated by thin lines, material flow by darkened lines, and information flow by dark. Got it? Let us see another example. Next slide, please. So let us take again. Of course, this this methodology is capable of even representing very complex systems. But still, for the sake of simplicity, to understand the ideas, we have taken the fingernail clipper again. A simple mechanical device. Okay. What is the energy flow? So the first one is the energy flow. Where is the energy for the fingernail clipper comes from? It is the the finger motion. It is the muscular energy. It is the finger force, the force exerted by the fingers. So that is the energy flow. Is there any energy outflow? Sound. It may click and then produce a sound. The kinetic energy in the nail. The way I click it, okay, the nail may the nail may be thrown off. Is it, is it okay? The nail may be, so that is the energy flow outside the system. But where does most of the energy go? Where does it go? Most of the energy, where does it go? In cutting the nail. So if you see, that will be, see, will the, will the energy coming in, will it be equal to the energy going out? Strictly speaking, Approximate. Will the energy coming in, will it be equal to the energy going out? No, sir. No. Because some mechanical work is also done by the system. Okay? So if you take the mechanical work done by the system, then you can establish an energy balance. Otherwise, no. Okay? We will come to that a bit later. Now, what are the mass flow? <coughs> what are the masses involved? In the nail, hands, debris. Again, cut nail, hands, debris. These are all the masses coming in and mass going out. Of course, the finger should come in and go out uh, without any mass loss. Okay. The finger must come in and then go out without any mass loss if the product functions properly. Now, what is the, is there any signal flow? Okay, probably your teacher would have told, hey, your nails are too long, you cut it. Probably that happens in the school. Okay, we, here we don't bother. But your mom would have told, no, your nails are, that is an information flow. For the whole action to take place. Generally speaking, a long nail, a hanging nail, a rough nail, okay. These could be the signals that trigger the whole action. And what is the output information? A good uh, appearance. appearance of the nail is the output that you get. Is it okay? Now you understand what I mean by a black box. What are the inputs? What are the outputs? What are the three types of inputs? How we designate them? Clear? Is it okay? Sh sh shall I go ahead? Next slide. Now again, certain definitions. We have already seen it. But still, I want to refresh some of the definitions we have seen already. System subsystem. System is something analogous to the black box that we are talking Anything can be viewed as a System. System designate a field of interest. Okay. I can view my entire body as a system. Is there any mass flow in and mass flow out? Yes. There is mass flow in and then mass flow out. Is there any energy flow in and energy flow out? There, there can be energy flow in and then energy flow out. Okay. 
design a signal flow in and then signal flow out, information flow, yes. I am able to, through my sensors, I am able to get some information in and information out. Anything of interest can be viewed as a system. Many times to study a system which is something complex, we divide it into many subsystems. A complex system cannot be studied internal. So many times what we do is, we divide the system into many subsystems so that you can, you can focus more, you can focus more, concentrate on something, okay, more narrow, more specific, and then study the flows in this so, you understand what we mean by systems and subsystems? Shall we proceed? Boundary interactions. Every system should have a well defined boundary. Okay. So, then only you can, you can identify something flowing in and then something flowing out. Unless you have a, a defined boundary, unless you have a defined boundary, you cannot, you cannot study anything about the interaction. So what is coming in and what is going out, they lose their meaning unless you have a well-defined boundary. And across boundary, what happens is flow. Something coming in, something going out. And this flow, it needs to be studied in terms of quantity as well as in terms of quality. What do I mean by quantity in terms of, or quantity or quality? Let me take an example. Suppose I am talking about a signal amplifier. So I am talking about an amplifier. Or, or rather, in electronics we use what is known as a signal condition. In electronics we use something called a signal condition. <coughs> or, because electronics people may not be very familiar, so let's take a, a mechanical system. Okay, you have in, in all the Shop flows, you have something called uh, uh, inspection. There is an inspection station. Of course, nowadays there is, there is a lot of uh, restructuring that are uh, being implemented in the inspection process, but still, what is the purpose of inspection? I produce thousand parts, all of them may not be good. I just inspect. Okay, accept the parts that are good and then reject whichever is not good. That is the objective of a, an inspection station. I produce thousand shafts. In a shift I produce thousand shafts. The dimension of all thousand cannot be within the acceptable limits. So what I have to do is, I have to check the dimension of each and every shaft, accept only what is, what is of acceptable dimension and then reject what is not. That is the job of, that is the job of inspection. inspection. That is the job of an inspection station. Is it okay? Now, here you should, what I wanted to explain is, is the idea of quality and in the inspection station, suppose I have I have thousand shafts which are which, which got entered. Okay? Now all the thousand are passed out. All the thousand shafts. They take for example in that particular shift, all the shafts were good. All the thousand shafts were passed out as good. 
But is there any difference between this thousand and this thousand? In terms of quantity, there is no difference. So here also thousand, in, in there also thousand. But in terms of quality, yes, there is a significant difference. About these thousand shafts, I didn't know anything. But these thousand shafts, I know that they satisfy my dimensional requirement. So, you have to, you have to study about the flow across boundaries, not only in terms of quality, in terms of, not only in terms of quantity, but in terms of quality also. And I'll give you another example. You have a catalytic converter. You have a, in, an, in all the formulas nowadays, you have a catalytic converter. You have a catalytic converter. What happens? Well, how many carbon atoms are coming? How many oxygen atoms are coming? To the catalytic converter and outside the catalytic converter, it doesn't do anything. Catalytic converter doesn't change the number of carbon atoms or number of oxygen atoms or number of nitrogen atoms. It doesn't change anything. All that comes in must go out. It is not a filter. A catalytic converter is not a filter. But what happens? Catalytic converter essentially converts carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide. So the change takes place in terms of quality. What here you have are all harmful gases and what comes out is Okay, less harmful gases. I won't say harmless gases. They are less harmful gases. Carbon dioxide is equally, I mean, not equally bad, but it is not again good. I cannot say, I cannot call carbon dioxide as a harmless gas. So here change takes place not in terms of quantity, but in terms of quality. Change takes place in, ter in terms of in terms of quality. Right. So you have the the flow of information across systems. See that is very difficult to the flow of information across systems is very difficult to identify, capture, represent, process, but that is very, very, very essential. In, in any system, capturing the flow of information is also very, very essential and that needs to be done very carefully. Any system receives so much of data and this data processing needs to be see data means don't think only in terms of bytes and the bits information can be in varied forms okay information I see certain things I react to that I hear systems can get mechanical inputs it can be the position of a lever it can be the position of a cable Okay, it can be the position of a level, it can be torque measured, okay, okay, so it can be many, many things, you have to measure all this carefully and process. Then, there is flow of matter and energy, generally anything, matter is something which has a mass, Okay, every matter it has certain mass and uh, any flow of mass across the system boundary is treated as a material flow. Energy, energy flow also takes place along systems and what we are interested in is arriving at a functional structure of systems. Ultimately, what we are interested in achieving is arriving at the 
functional structure of a system. So, in the in the next slide, I am going.